In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. They joke um, that when the Roman Church finally decides to ordain married men, and you know sooner or later they will, the document announcing this entirely new thing is going to begin. The church has always taught. There, there is this myth that the church has this never-changing grasp on never-changing truths. But let's be ecumenical here. This really isn't just a thing that the Romans do. They don't have the market cornered on this notion that they're supposed unchanging truths. You may remember all the decades of anguish that our church faced, oh, 10 years ago and before, over questions of human sexuality. And you may remember that one of the slogans that was shouted by the people who were critical of the direction that our church was moving with regard to human sexuality was that while we were going to hell in a handbasket, they were standing up for the faith once delivered to the saints. That's a quote from the letter of Jude in the New Testament. The church has always taught the faith once delivered to the saints, this notion that there is this unchanging body of truth. So those people left the church, most of them, and then there were we Episcopalians who remained, and we're not exactly exempt from this either, you know. People joke that if the Episcopal ch had a Church had an official motto, it would be, we've always done it this way. I mean, I don't mean Episcopalians here at the cathedral. I mean all the other Episcopalians in the church. We've always done it that way. And, and I get it. Because in a world where things are changing at an unimaginable pace, it would be nice to have an unchanging religion and an unchanging church. The church has always taught the faith once delivered to the saints. We've always, always done it this way. Change is hard, and not just religious change. Change forces us to accept that at any minute, the things that we assume are just the way things are, the way things always have been and always have to be, those things could prove in the next minute to be the way things once were, but are no more, and probably never will be again. The world just has moved on. And it's not just in religion. The whole Make America Great Again thing is the nationalistic version of this religious impulse to hold on to the illusion that we can keep things from changing that there is some way it always was, and it really always needs to be that way, that nothing can change. But we all know that that simply is an illusion. It simply isn't true. So, Peter got caught with his hand in the bacon jar. Some Jews had come to accept Jesus as their Savior, and they heard that Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, was eating with uncircumcised men. And that meant that Peter was not keeping kosher. Peter was not keeping kosher. The second book of Maccabees, one of the deuterocanonical books that we Anglicans, along with Eastern Christians and Roman Catholics, read as a sacred text, the second book of Maccabees tells the story just 200 years before Peter had this experience that we hear about in the Acts of the Apostles. Just 200 years before that, there were these seven brothers named Maccabee, and they were willing to endure the most tremendously painful torture 
rather than eat pork. The story tells us they had their hands and their feet amputated. Their tongues were cut out. They scalped them. They cooked them alive. They fried them alive. And still, they would endure all of that rather than eat pork. And all of this while their mother watched. And I'm not telling you this. It's a terrible story. And I'm not telling you this to be sensationalistic. I'm telling you this to give you a sense of how seriously the Jews of Jesus' time took the kosher laws. And whether the tale of the Maccabees is really literally true or not doesn't matter. What is undeniably true is that this story wanted to make clear that eating pork was such a repulsive thing to Jews that it was easier for them to die. It was easier for them to die than to eat pork. And there Peter was doing potentially that very thing. There he was eating with uncircumcised men, eating with Gentiles. And when you sit at table with people, you eat what they serve you. And so that implied the unthinkable that Peter might even have been eating pork. And he claimed that God told him to do it. He claimed that the will of God was that he should go contrary to what every Jew forever had been sure was the will of God, that God was telling him to go against the will of God. It was the will of God that he abandon the will of God. The church has always taught the faith once delivered to the saints. We've always done it that way. I'm not sure what you do with all those slogans, those shorthand little capsulations of what people think. I'm not sure what you do with all of that in light of Peter's dream. Because in essence, what Peter's dream taught him was that sometimes we have to let go of what we have always taught. What we once cling to as if it came to us from the hand of God sometimes has to be put down. What we have always done is not necessarily what we should ever do again. And this is nothing less than God's will that we let it go and set it down and never do it again. It's sometimes said that Christianity along with Islam and Judaism are religions of the book. I'm sure you've heard that said. Religions rooted in a sacred text. But in fact, it seems to me that Christianity is not a religion of the book. Muslims hold that God literally gave Muhammad a book. God literally dictated every letter of the Quran. And Jews traditionally hold that God dictated the Torah, the first five books of what we call the Old Testament, literally dictated it to Moses, word for word, that God gave Moses a book. But it is not so with us. What God gave us was Jesus. God gave us a person, a person as human as you or me. God did not give us a book. God gave us God's very self. And when Jesus was taken up into glory, he did not leave us a book. It was hundreds of years after the death and glorification of Jesus before the church took these 27 pamphlets and collected them into what we call the New Testament. Hundreds of years after Jesus' glorification. When Jesus was taken up into glory, he did not leave us a book. What Jesus left behind was a community. What Jesus left for us was us. 
just little old us. If Peter had looked only to the book, he would never have eaten with those uncircumcised men. And brothers and sisters, not one of us in this room, or maybe one or two, would even be here. There would be no Christianity if Peter had relied only on the book as he knew it. Even if Peter had relied on the disciples' memories of what Jesus said or Jesus did, Peter would not have eaten with those uncircumcised men. We have no evidence at all that the earthly Jesus abandoned the Jewish dietary regulations or he incited other people to do it. And yet, Peter abandoned it. And I think that is what Easter is all about. Easter, it is often said, is the celebration of the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. But Easter, in fact, is not the celebration of the long, long ago historical event that Jesus was raised from the dead. Easter is the celebration that Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. He is alive here and now. Easter is about the living, risen Jesus. And the living, risen Jesus still acts in the world as he did in his earthly time, but now through his Holy Spirit. So, knowing what we Christians are to do and what exactly we are to believe is never as simple as consulting a book. The thing is, the church has always taught that the Holy Spirit of the risen Jesus is moving among us and leading us to places we have never been before because we live in a world that has never existed before. This passage from Acts we heard today about the vision of Peter tells us, if nothing else, that the faith once delivered to the saints, and Peter was one of those saints, that the faith once delivered to the saints is that God can call us to abandon even what we perceive to be the will of God so that we can do the will of God. And the way we've always done it is to listen to our ancestors, to take what they have bequeathed to us with the greatest seriousness and to treat it with the greatest respect, but then to realize that someday we are going to be the ancestors and we too can hear the voice of Jesus speaking a word that sometimes takes us in a direction we never imagined and certainly never wanted. You remember what Peter said. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? The issue for the church as we confront the realities of the modern world is not whether we are being modern enough. It is not whether we are being politically correct enough. It's not even whether we're doing things to be attractive to outsiders. None of that is the issue. The issue is whether we are paying attention as Peter did to his dream and seeing what Jesus is trying to do in the world today and letting him do it through us. Who are we to hinder God? Soon we will approach the Lord's table to celebrate the Holy Eucharist. 
In the Eucharist, Jesus gives us the comfort of his real presence. Jesus gives us his very life. But there is more in the Eucharist than comfort. There is also a challenge. Because in the Eucharist, we join our lives to his life, to his risen life, so that through us, he can continue his work on earth today. Peter and the other disciples realized not long after Jesus had been glorified that what Jesus meant to do in the world in their time was nothing they had ever imagined God would ever do. In fact, Jesus was calling them to do the opposite of what they imagined God would ever do. But seeing it, seeing the call, they did it, as unlikely as it was. And so what is Jesus, alive and present among us, trying to do in our world today? What is he calling us to do in our world, in our world today? This world that never existed before. That's not for me to say, of course. I, I don't know. But what I do know is that what Jesus is calling us to do may very well be something that will disturb us, that will be unimaginable for us, but that, in fact, will be God's gracious will. <laughs>